whenever we do have a win, it's always a really powerful reminder that corporations sometimes seem untouchable and they're way more fragile than they think they are when a lot of people around the world come together. I would say we have all the power. We really do. It sounds so big and blue sky, but it is actually true. And when you come together, you really move things. It's time to change the world. It's time for something better. We're telling the stories of people who are changing the world and how you can help. Our daily actions have a massive impact. So what will we do about it? We can remake the world. Because guess what? We can. Hi everyone. I'm Nathan Gardner and this is We Can Remake the World. A podcast about people who are changing the world and how you can help. Thanks for being here with us today. We're going to start, as we do with every episode this year, with some good news. Good news number one. March 21st was International Day of Forests around the world, and there was a lot to celebrate this year. A recent accord agreed to by two dozen countries commits each of these countries to ending deforestation in any form for any reason, as far as I've understood it, by 2030 in this decade. A lot of these countries are countries which agreed to the Paris Climate Accords, and it's a really exciting commitment to see governments making. Let's go to some specific local progress that's being made around the world. In the United States, for example, Oregon lawmakers just passed legislation to conserve over 81,000 acres of forest within Oregon, which supports 20% of the native coho salmon population and contains significant old-growth forests. An initiative in Florida will protect 11,000 square miles of natural ecosystems, some farms, some of it is inhabited, as well as forested wetlands. It's kind of a uniquely diverse area with a lot of natural ecosystems with humans peppered in as well, but a lot of it is nature. It's now been designated the Northwest Florida Sentinel Landscape and will be protected moving forward. In Australia, logging of native trees in one specific region will end to preserve over 1,500 square miles in one of the most diverse forests on Earth, which includes trees that are threatened by logging and exist nowhere else on the planet. These trees are only unique to this one forest, but now they'll be preserved. And in South America, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has allocated an additional $300 million toward the Andes Amazon Initiative, which they manage to continue biodiversity and conservation efforts in South America through 2031. Efforts from this foundation have successfully conserved over one and a half million square miles of land already, or about half of the land area of Brazil. So, no small thing. And this is since beginning their work in South America in 2003. So, one and a half million square miles preserved in less than 20 years. Pretty exciting. So, lots of good news for trees, ecosystems, wildlife, and for nature to celebrate. Also, I have to be honest, I didn't know that International Day of Forests was a thing, so let's celebrate it next March 21st with a little more intention. Pretty cool, especially for those of us who are passionate about forests, and I am definitely a forest spirit, so this makes me really happy. Let's do all we can to amplify these examples, these stories of positive change, to ensure that we see more of them out there soon. For our next piece of good news, we go to Nigeria to celebrate the inventive work of a local mom after her baby son went through a terrible health scare. This mom, named Virtue Oboro, rushed to the neonatal intensive care unit in her local area when her son was just 48 hours old due to severe jaundice, which was caused by a buildup of bilirubin in the blood, which can be fatal if not treated. This is not uncommon around the world. The treatment for this, for jaundice, involves blue light therapy, which breaks down the bilirubin in infant bodies so that they can process it and recover. But the hospital where Oboro lived had no blue light devices. Her son had to undergo an emergency blood infusion, which is full of risk. Thankfully, he is healthy to this day. They were fortunate. But Virtue Oboro was changed by the experience and resolved to do something about it. 
she and her husband worked together with a local pediatrician to create a solar-powered, portable phytotherapy unit. Phytotherapy units are those blue light units, which can help support these infants who need it. And these units, which Aboro and her husband and the pediatrician created, can be leveraged by any health center or hospital with or without electricity because it's powered by solar power. The unit they've created costs one-sixth of the price of a normal phytotherapy device, making it more accessible to all forms of healthcare organizations, from hospitals to clinics and even less formal healthcare providers. And the device works in remote and rural areas due to its solar source of energy. Again, no limitations on the power source. The Crib Aglow, as it's called, from the company that Abaro created, which she named Tiny Hearts, can now be found in over 500 hospitals across Nigeria and neighboring Ghana, and has already been used to treat over 300,000 babies in hospitals in those two countries. According to Virtue Oboro, an additional 200,000 babies have been saved from jaundice in rural areas as well, whose numbers and reporting may not be as consistent as hospitals, but which is no less important. What an example of the power of one person to make a true difference in many lives through creativity and commitment. I think it's amazing, and I wish we heard more stories like this every day out there. Don't you? Let's get to our episode. When we kicked off this year, in our first episode for 2022, we asked a big question. How? How do we make change? How do we build movements around important ideas? How do we get ourselves from wanting to be better and wanting to do better to actually seeing shifts taking place in the world around us and being part of making that happen. Our guests today have an answer. Founded in 2011, Some of Us is a global corporate watchdog group made up of over 20 million individuals all around the world. If you're not familiar with them already, the millions of members of the Some of Us community take action on campaigns that the Some of Us team and individual members find and then amplify to increase awareness and then take action around those campaigns. The campaigns that Some of Us focuses on and highlights to its community are diverse, but are primarily aligned to ideas around protection of human rights, sustainability, and the environment. Some of the main areas of focus for Some of Us, which I've taken from their website, include environmental justice and sustainability, animal rights and protection, human and workers' rights, civil liberties, equitable trade, racial and economic justice, and data protection and digital rights, which is one that we are hearing more about these days, but I think we really need to be talking about more. There are several types of actions that some of us community members can take to support the campaigns that the organization highlights to its community. A big one is signing online petitions, which members of the some of us staff then take to private companies, governments, and conferences and non-governmental organizations to demonstrate citizen and consumer awareness and demands. Community members can also donate to support the funding of grassroots individuals or organizations on the ground who are advocating for change or standing up to corporate interests and the exploitation that they might see or be experiencing. Members also can join live protests and direct action, demonstrations. They can collaborate with other direct action and advocacy organizations around the world to give a greater voice to initiatives that matter when it comes to protecting people and planet. I want to give you a couple examples of current campaigns that are featured on the Some of Us website, just so you get a sense of what they do and some of the topics they focus on. A big topic circulating in a few different campaigns currently on Some of Us involve global corporations and their involvement with unsustainable palm oil production in Asia, which we actually covered in a past episode last year with famed conservationist Dr. Ian Singleton, who was working really hard to protect the habitats of the orangutan in Indonesia. Some of these companies represent 
household brands that all of us have heard of and almost all of us have purchased from, including Mondelez, who was responsible for Oreo cookies, Ritz crackers, Cadbury chocolates, and Yum Brands, which is the parent company of KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Pizza Hut, huge fast food chains, which are now global, headquartered in the United States. We've all heard of these companies, but we haven't necessarily heard that they are knowingly contributing to rainforest destruction, which is impacting climate change and loss of habitat for orangutans, Sumatran rhinos, Indonesian elephants, to name a few. The impacts here are massive. You should go back and listen to our episode with Dr. Singleton if you want to learn more. It's a really important topic to familiarize yourself with. Some of us is working to amplify these stories so that people are aware of what's going on. And they're hoping to repeat the success of a successful campaign focused on Pepsi, which gathered over 1 million signatures when it was live and contributed to Pepsi actually overhauling its palm oil policy in 2020. It's a topic they really have to speak on now and show up for. Other campaigns include demanding that Meta, the parent company of Facebook, take responsibility on all of its platforms, including Facebook especially, for allowing posts and content which are inciting violence and what some are calling genocide in India. Some of us is demanding that Facebook also acknowledge and dismantle the illegal endangered species trade, which is currently taking place on its platform, which I couldn't believe. There's a campaign to pressure the Brazilian government through global awareness to stop a proposed piece of legislation by Bolsonaro's government, the current president, which would legalize the expulsion of indigenous peoples from their native lands in the Amazon region and open up the heart of the Amazon to industrial development at a time when the world's ecosystems are losing balance, when we need our trees to protect us from the release of carbon and contributions to greenhouse gases and climate change. Finally, some of us is raising awareness around the draconian sections of the police, crime, courts, and sentencing bill in the United Kingdom, which allows the police and the government to massively restrict protesting in any form, no matter what the topic is. This aspect of the bill was only just potentially stopped in the UK Parliament on March 22nd, really recently, and the bill is still being debated as far as the way that it could unfold. Some of these protest restrictions could still happen. Imagine if the police could forcibly end a protest simply because they said someone complained that it was too noisy. That's one example of what's at stake with this bill in the UK. These are some of the big issues of our time, and for anyone who values people and planet, it's a lot of heavy, important stuff with big implications. We recently spoke with three members of the Global Some of Us team, Angus in Canada, Laura in Mexico, and Ildim in Germany, to learn more about what drives them each individually in their work with Some of Us, how they've seen some of these campaigns and the actions of Some of Us change lives and change conversations and make a real positive impact, and why each of them believe that uniting the power of everyday citizens is the key to changing our world for good. Perfect. So I'm really pleased today to be joined by three members of the Some of Us team from different parts of the world. Uh, We're joined by Laura, Angus, and Ildem. And I'm really glad to have each of the three of you. Thank you so much. And just to, you know, spare you all the confusion of talking over each other, just to say hello, um, maybe we can go down the list. And I'd love each of you to just introduce yourselves briefly, maybe talk about what brought you to some of us originally, and anything you'd like to share about yourself and your position and maybe where you're based. Um, So let's start with Laura, if you don't mind kind of kicking us off. Yeah, of course. Thanks for the invitation to be on the podcast today. Um, I actually ran into some of us five years ago, and I was actually working for another human rights organization in Mexico, which is where I'm from. Um, in terms of my role, I'm, I tend to wear a lot of different hats, but uh, the core of my work is a membership team. So I'm kind of on, on the front lines with a few other colleagues of being in touch directly with almost over actually 20 million supporters around the world um, that follow some of us and participate in our work. And I'm also, I also do a little bit of social media strategy and um, I'm part of the team growing our membership in Latin America, which 
has been really successful and it's been a very exciting recent development. Um, and personally, I've ranged, I've worked in a range of nonprofits um, since since graduating college and before that I was already interested in social justice and activism. Um, but I think what I value most about some of us is that it's been the healthiest work environment that I've worked in. Um, it's an it's definitely been the place with the strongest commitment to anti-oppression, both in its values in the work and also internally. And we can we can speak more to that later. Yeah, perfect. I'd definitely love to hear. I mean, it's always nice to hear when an organization's values are actually reflected in how they treat their team and how they encourage their own culture. So would love to hear more about that as we get started. Um, perfect. Thanks, Laura. Maybe let's go to you next, Angus, if that sounds good. Yeah, um, I'm Angus. Um, yeah, I came to some of us nine years ago when the organization was uh, just a year old. I actually came from a background in social corporate responsibility, but that work, my previous work in social corporate responsibility, I think didn't really completely land with my worldview. And I, I, I was there for five years and I took a little break just to figure things out. What I did for a couple months there was just do, did a little bit of volunteering. And I spent actually a lot of time on social media and I think like kind of just express my thoughts on the world. Um, that, that was back when uh, Facebook was a little bit more democratic and and stuff and in one of my social media posts i think or in many of my social media posts i think i just like complain about like the roles of corporations and how they have too much power in this in this world and and such and then i think it caught an eye of a friend of a friend who was actually just at some of us at the time but was leaving and so um she, she reached out to me and was just like, Hey, I'm leaving some of us. Um, I loved working with them, but I have another opportunity. Um, you should interview for this position. And when I, when I first read, Oh, this is about people over profit. I just thought I found my home and here, here I am nine years later. Um, and, um, cool. yeah, I, 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 I came from a background doing a little bit like supporting, uh, mining company. So a, a bunch of my work, um, and I think I'll, maybe I'll talk about it a little bit more is about ANSI mining, and um, I also have a strong interest in doing uh, Palestinian solidarity work. I'm based in Vancouver, so uh, I also do a lot of Canadian corporate accountability uh, campaigns as well. That's great. No, it's awesome. Angus, the two things I think you and I had connected on speaking about today, you, uh, you've you already alluded to as far as you know, Facebook, social media, some of the implications there in the world these days, and then some of the mining programs I know that some of us has been close to. And there's one especially that I'm really excited to ask you about. Um, so before we go to Ildem, if you don't mind, Angus, would you just give us a little bit of insight into how some of us kind of came to be? You know, what contributed to the founding of it, if you're aware, or kind of what were the intentions as the organization was, was getting started i would imagine you've seen a lot of you know growth and change over the last almost decade you know what um you know what really prompted some of us to to start its work yeah the story that uh i kind of remember is our uh, the founder of some of us taryn steinbrecher kaufman who's no longer at the organization but i i still keep in touch with from time to time she there was this um early energy in on the progressive uh liberal like online space that it was just starting and she just saw space for an online organization that can bring people to together to fight corporate power. And so she, she just kind of made it happen and it started with, it just started small. It was just a few people uh, unpaid. And um, here we are 10 years later, uh, 20 million people have uh, taken action on, uh, on our platform and we've won many, many, many corporate campaigns. And I think we're, staff of 40 right now. Um, so we're growing and, and, um, yeah, here we are 10 years later. Super exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to dig more into some of the successes that some of us has, has had too. Perfect. Thanks Angus and Ildem last, but certainly not least, we'd love to hear a little bit about you too. Right. Thank you so much for having us. Yes. I'm Ildem. I'm, uh, the campaigner within the German speaking team. So I do most of everything German language related. I say most because we do have other staff that does also some German language uh, work. And yeah, I've come to some of us rather recently. So I'm kind of a new ad. I think I'm the youngest uh, staffer, I guess, at this point today at the panel. Um, I came straight out of grad school in a way. I was finishing up grad school. I was I had a different work commitment. I finished 
both at the same time and in the around the same time um, this position opened as a German um, language campaigner I applied took my chance I was like oh no like me new fresh freshly baked grad school person and yeah um, and I think it just reflects also some of us's way of work right they're very generous and they're open to anyone who shows a commitment to people over profit and that's how I ended here I done a lot of different kinds but intersecting ways of activism of course before coming to some of us kind of as a professional campaigner so that's my very short story of being here and it's been just over a year for me perfect yeah Ildim, did you always did you study sort of you know work along these lines when you were in grad school is this sort of a position that made sense of what you were studying or did you sort of find yourself in this through your activism and through some of your passions outside of your studies I think it's both. So I, I did do international relations as a bachelor, peace studies as a master. So there is always that discourse, but it's very rigid. And I think I just molded my space into like, what is justice? What is global justice? Hmm. And mostly also guided always by intersectional activism, right? Everything goes together. And um, it's important not to look at things from a single take perspective. And I think Laura already scratched on it that we do a lot of anti-oppressive work. And that what kind of pushed me to do this, right? While I did do like the theoretical work and I've observed and worked within diplomacy, it's it was more like the intersectional anti-oppressive nature that really pushed me here. And that I've also done outside of some of us, of course, and alongside my studies but then some of us were the perfect opportunity for me to really get into it on a professional level yeah great yeah it sounds like a really great opportunity based on kind of the, the path that you were already on um you know Ildem, if you wouldn't mind i'd love to hear you kind of start us off with some of the um some of the questions around some of us's work and and what's already been done in the world. Would you talk a little bit about how some of us encourages its members to take action, sort of some of the tactics that the organization focuses on? Um, what are the tools that some of us uses to engage its community that it's built and to sort of take action out there in the world to support initiatives which prioritize human rights and people over over profit and sort of corporate interest and, and oppression in any form? Sure, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of ways that we work, right? But our ultimate base, we're like corporate campaigning or get the moment, but our ultimate base is petitions. So that's like the foundation of our work. We create petitions on topics that we choose, on the campaign targets that we choose, and send it to our members and be like, hey, let's rally together and do this. Um, let's push this target. Again, that's our ultimate base. But of course, this is just a foundation to build more. So we do fundraisers. We come together with other organizations, initiatives, initiatives, sorry, and communities where we really take sometimes also like offline action. We come together, we get on the streets, we protest, we do um, little stunts in front of be it parliaments or uh, headquarters. So it really is a different set and depending on the campaign and the time. Um, we do adjust accordingly. So there is a wide set of things we do, but we also do very, I would say, kind of unique ways of campaigning and tactics. So shareholder activism is big for us, especially within supply chain work or disinfo work, where we really tap into that power of our members of just people and their um, powers and all the access they have. And we usually hone into that as well. But um yeah, and outside of these kind of tactics, we also do a lot of educational um, and empowering kind of little webinars and seminars. We even host workshops like we are really into resource sharing, too. So we are really open to hosting workshops um, or sharing just the work we do with our audience, our members, anyone who wants to get into it. So you will definitely find that as a way of tactic too, which is more uh, less prominent than just like, you know, sending a petition or doing an offline action. Yeah. No, I think you make a really good point about the educational kind of aspect of some of us and myself, you know, when I was exploring the organization, there were things that I'd never seen come across any type of news, mainstream or alternative that I'm aware of. And it seems like a huge service that some of us provides is sort of increasing awareness around what's happening in the world, you know, geographically and in with stories that may not make it to the mainstream media and 
you know, Laura, I'd love to ask you if you don't mind to speak about whether or not that's sort of an intentional, you know, choice that some of us has made to really, you know, we want to be sure that we're giving voice to issues that we see as being important that really matter that may not reach the mainstream news or bring an aspect of a mainstream story to greater light to kind of for their audience. Because I see a huge amount of value in that with some of us, like really detailed insight into some of these things on the ground that I haven't seen anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's not necessarily intentional. Like our work focuses on curbing corporate power at all levels. Um, as you mentioned, it's not really an issue that is covered by mainstream media often. But with that said, there's also been an increasing public awareness, especially in some of the areas we campaign like disinformation, for example, or holding big tech accountable has been an area that has gotten a lot of attention um, in the past few years. So in the sense, we also target companies that are making headlines already. But with that said, we do we do want to take on corporations at all levels, and we look to we do prioritize partnering with organizations or movements that are more grassroots um, and more local. Um, so, for example, some of a, a couple of campaigns that I was personally involved in in the last year that were very inspiring. One was in Argentina, where we had a very successful fundraiser to help a woman um, in a rural community of Argentina who's been fighting to ban glyphosate. Um, she's been fighting Monsanto, which is now owned by Bayer, for 20 years after her newborn um, died because of pesticide intoxication. Um, and it's a community that has severe health issues and they've been fighting in the court. So our members came together and we were able to grant um, funds to her to go to trial, which was really inspiring. Wow. So this was a very small community that got attention got the attention of 20 million people around the world. And yeah. um, there was a lot of gratitude, obviously. And, and another actually recent campaign that we did is, well, it's still ongoing in Colombia that we partnered with the Misak community, that they're fighting an Irish multinational. It's a cardboard company, and they're trying to displace them to exploit the land. Um, and it's also been a really successful campaign. And we actually also... Uh, sent a team to do more of a reporting and photography. And now one member of the community is traveling to Europe um, to the annual general meeting to have their voice heard. So we do, we do it with the lens of anti-oppression um, that we've mentioned several times, we, we obviously, we look at the structures of oppression and, and we want to leverage the resources we have um, to also partner with with movements that usually are part organizations, individuals that wouldn't have access to those resources or to that kind of media. Um, but yeah, corporate power is everywhere. So <laughs> any yeah. any opportunity where a corporation is not behaving well, it's an opportunity for us to campaign yeah. too. Well, there's a lot of opportunity for you in that case, <laughs> you know, unfortunately. Um, but the, the really positive takeaway from that point, I think, is that through technology, the visibility into some of these things is so much greater. And so, and through technology, connecting somebody like this woman in Argentina who may have had very little recourse otherwise, who's a very small David against a very big Goliath, like an organization like some of us can really be an incredible and powerful game changer for someone like her. And so um, I think it's really, you know, impressive. And I think the holistic approach that it sounds like some of us takes is also really encouraging and kind of inspiring. Like it's not just one aspect. It's not just activism and getting people out on the streets. It's not just signing petitions online. It's also really getting close to some of these issues and getting directly involved. And I think that's really powerful. You, do you mind if I ask Laura, how some of us finds, so, I mean, how did the organization find this individual in Argentina as an example? And if you don't know the specifics, just, is there a team that almost researches and, and looks for opportunities to, you know, step in and, and su offer support in whatever form feels like the most appropriate form. Yeah. Um, Angus and Ildem can also speak to this as their, their campaigners. Um, with the case of Sofia Gatica, who's this woman in Argentina, a lot of, I mean, we find out about a lot of things by reading news sometimes or word of mouth from other work we're involved in or partners we already have built, have been building relationships with over the years. Um, in the case of Sofia Gatica, she actually um, knew another uh, another person that we worked with, a farmer from France that we also collaborated with, who's also been fighting pesticides for many years. Um, so they knew each other, and we, as part of our work to grow our membership in Latin America and really focus more on the global south and and use our resources to 
to take action in the region. Um, we reached out to her. Like a lot of this is very organic. I just emailed her and hoped to get a response and then got on a call with her and we just hit it off from there. And, and it was very collaborative. Like we definitely, I think one of the main things we we make sure of when we reach out to a partner is, is making sure they they actually want our help and we can actually be of service to their work. You know, we're not trying to come in and take over a campaign that's already existing. It's really, it's really a collaborative communication of how can we contribute to this or bring attention to this um, by uplifting the partner's work. Yeah, I love that. It just feels really real, the fact that it's more organic. And also, I think even though some of us is, you know, relatively large nonprofit with a staff of 40, and as you're saying, 20 million people who are interacting with it, it I, I love hearing that you're really focused on inter, um, interacting and collaborating with grassroots organizations, because I don't know, as I've been speaking to some of our recent guests who are grassroots nonprofits and things, it sounds like there's there's so much power in small local impact. And when you put that together across the globe and, you know, as you all support several initiatives, like I think the overall momentum that grows from that is is really powerful. And a lot of grassroots organizations are really close to these things. And so supporting them as they do their work and getting close to just an individual human being. I mean, I just love hearing that from an organization that's as large as some of us, frankly. You know, not that it's huge in comparison to a massive corporation with 40 staff members, but for a nonprofit that's impact driven, that's pretty sizable, I think. Um, so that's just really great to hear. You know, and Angus, I'd love to go to you since we're speaking about sort of South America and Latin America. I, I know that there's an initiative that you, I think, were pretty close to with um, a woman named Maxima Acuna. And I know that mining is involved here as well. And, and I'd love to hear you just tell a bit about that story. When I read about this, I was just really struck by it. And this woman who had such courage and put so much on the line to stand up to very powerful interests. Um, you know, you'll tell the story better than me, so I'll, I'll let you do so. Um, but I'd love to hear you speak about that if you'd be willing. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, it, it's funny that you picked of all the campaigns I've worked on and, uh, you, you've, you picked this one because it is actually the one that I'm the most passionate about. Um, yeah, like it, and it stems from my history of working for uh, social corporate responsibility and having to right the wrongs of the mining company and realizing that there isn't really much room to make mining more ethical. So, and, and this is why I was super excited to when I joined some of us because I'd be able to take on these corporations that do so much wrong in the world. Um, so, I, I actually um, one of my first international campaigns was a, another mining campaign. It was to stop a mine in Alaska that was going to ruin like the biggest sockeye salmon run in the world. And through that group, we, we stopped that mine that was in Alaska. And I just was having so much fun working with uh, this group on a serious topic, but like we just gelled real well. So I just was interested in what Earthworks was doing. And I, I read the story in 2014 about Maxima. And what was happening in Peru was that the world's l largest gold mining company, Newmont Mining, was attempting to build a huge open pit copper and go gold mine. And there was one woman named Maxima who was resisting uh, them at every turn. And Newmont really needed uh, her land to build this open pit mine. But Maxima just would not sell, would not get off her land. And through that, um, Newmont and the, the associated company, like, harassed her with security guards um and that's when we started uh we as some of us uh came in uh we started a petition and to date it has two hundred thousand signatures if you if your listeners want to sign it uh you can go to some some of us.org slash maxima when she heard that like a hundred thousand people uh signed it when when it reached that mark uh the people that uh we worked with uh, the the local grassroots peruvian groups that were supporting Maxima in this in this fight against Newmont Mining. It's been a seven-year campaign. The, the mine still has not been built thanks to uh, Maxima's support, but some of the things that we've done in the last seven, eight years, we uh, we fundraised for her. Like We just asked our members to donate a few dollars so Maxima can attend Newmont's annual general meeting just so she can tell the story to the shareholders of like, what is happening? What their what their company is doing uh, to her and her land and 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 her people and her neighbors? We we financially supported uh, her lawyers. Newmont tried to sue her over and over again to get the land. It's kind of a bogus suit, but this is one of the tactics that corporations have to just sue 
people and we were able to you know like a few dollars here a few dollars there support her lawyers in uh, making sure that she's not fine or go to jail for various different and her land wasn't taken and uh, she still continues to live on her on her land to this day uh, we spoke out when Newmont's security guards invaded her house and uh, we were able to get some publicity there and th- for all that uh, she uh, because of the groups that work with her she she won the green nobel prize i think four or five years ago and that notoriety i think has kept Newmont like a little bit at bay and you know we that, that was a story of success that we we, we celebrated you know, we've been supporting uh, Maxima for a while. And um, I have a longer note that uh, uh, um, Maxima and her family sent us. Do you mind if I read that that note? Please yeah, do. Okay. No, uh, please I haven't do. read it in a while, so I'm just going to... Uh, uh, it would be nice to go down memory lane, too. Uh, okay, uh, it says, Dear friends, for the last 10 years, uh, our family has faced legal community and even personal struggles that have caused damage to our physical, psychological, and economic well-being as individuals and as a family. All of this because we decided to defend that which we believe deserved to be protected independent of our social and economics position. However, our resistance would not have been possible if in our path we hadn't encountered the infinite support of organizations such as some of us and the individual supporters What's more, we found people willing to fight alongside of us, shoulder to shoulder, and we have made our struggles your struggles and our victories your victories. Most of all, you have made our needs your needs. Thank you. Right now, our family is facing a crucial stage of our struggle. We've had a number of important accomplishments, but we're still in search of more decisive decisions. The support of some of us members has been critical, and it is more important than ever to remain uh, united to defend our rights, which are also everyone's rights. Sincerely, Maxima and her family. Hmm. Wow. I mean, I just got chills at the end because of what she says about how this is everyone's rights. If, if, if a woman like Maxima and her family can lose their land because of corporate interests with no resistance, what does that mean for every, you know, small landowner around the world who may be situated where there's corporate interest you know it's like the the idea of precedent and what i also was thinking about as you were speaking angus is just how powerful something like an organization like some of us is because it can start to build not only awareness but connections around the world we we can take maxima's example and apply it to anybody else who's in a similar situation we can learn from it we can empower others to say you're not alone in this fight we've had success with with you know situations like this in the past so you know, there's solidarity that can come from something like that. And as more people interact with an organization like some of us and learn about these things, um, then as that awareness grows, then more people will say, you know, this isn't right and it doesn't have to be this way. And we've seen it play out. I mean, I just think that's some of what I am so excited about with an organization like some of us and learning more about it and, um, and just understanding you know, how very real the outcomes are for the work that you all do. Um, So yeah, thanks for sharing that. I mean, it's always really powerful to hear from someone on the ground who's, you know, going through this every day, who's really in danger. And a lot of these activists, whatever they're focused on, you know, they are putting themselves at risk in many ways. And um, it's really powerful when they don't stand alone. So um, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Angus. Um, uh, you know, Angus, there's another topic I think that we um, we're going to connect on, which is to do with social media, which you alluded to as you were kind of introducing yourself. And some of the, you know, we've all become aware of the story of Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower, now Meta uh, whistleblower, who has shared some of her concerns openly about, you know, the policy of that organization not to take the user, the mental health of its users very seriously. And, um, and also, there have been violent acts and oppressive, very oppressive acts carried out through Meta's platforms with very little, you know, regulation, very little, you know, mitigation from the organization. And if you'd be willing, I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about that as well um, and just sort of what you've seen and what maybe is if, if some of us were to go a little deeper, as I'm sure you have, what we could sort of stand to understand more about this topic. Cause you know, we only get so much from, from the story that comes out about Francis Haugen, but there's really a lot of very serious implications from this conversation that I think not all of us have considered or been exposed to. Yeah. I, I, 
it's also interesting that you talk about Francis Hagen because um, we were actually act very actively in touch with Francis. Not me personally, but we have a full disinformation team at some of us that has been working on, uh, with Francis and, and others to hold Facebook and other uh, social media corporations accountable. When Francis, uh, you know, heroically uh, blew the whistle, uh, we we start talking to her and her representative. And so when she took her story to the European Parliament, we were able to stand with her in front of the courts, uh, in, in front of the Parliament. And our, our colleagues had uh, the signatures of 90,000 people that signed the petition like to, to show support of big tech whistleblowers such as Francis and just encourage her as she like, you know, continues to blow the whistle on this very important story. Um, that's just, you know... One of the one of the many ways that we're trying to hold Facebook and other corporation uh, Meta and other corporations like that accountable in this era of like misinformation and 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 whatnot. Yeah, and when social media really, I mean, can be the driving force be behind revolutions within organizations, where you know, you know. Um, ethnic cleansing almost activities are taking place around the world, sometimes incited by social media posts. I mean, it's it's something that maybe in Western developed nations we have moderate exposure to through the news and we don't see it play out in our daily lives unless we have relatives in these areas. But there are parts of the world that, you know, people are in danger because of actions taken on social media and um, sensitivity around that, awareness around that, and building regulations and, you know, structure around that um, really ought to be at the core of what these organizations are are doing to take responsibility for, for what their, you know, presences out there. Um, just as, you know, with some of our other guests, we've spoken about product end of life and how organizations which manufacture, you know, technology or plastic products, they really should have responsibility for what happens to that product when it's no longer being used or something like that. It just seems to be, to make sense. Um, these organizations where information is their business really, we've got to hold them accountable as, as I think we're saying. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, Laura and Ildem both too, if you don't, mind jump in and speak about a couple of initiatives or campaigns that you've gotten close to that really were powerful for you or that you are sort of especially proud of maybe the impact that the organization was able to make. Um, whatever angle you want to take is great. Laura, I know you mentioned the the individual in Argentina that you worked closely with, but if there are any others, I'd love to hear both you and Ildem speak about something that really kind of spoke to your passions and, and your values and um, how you were able to get involved. Um, yeah, well, I feel the ones I shared definitely, uh, they were, they were dear to my heart, but I, I did want to mention another campaign that, uh, the disinf disinformation team has been carrying out over the last year related to this topic on social media that you were just alluding to. Um, there's Instagram wanted to start this site specifically targeting children, uh, called Instagram for kids. And it's just a terrible project overall because then, you're having really young kids uh, seeing ads yeah. with everything from like they're promoting diet pills and just, I mean, really a really toxic environment. So some of us actually was involved. Um, we got 125,000 people to sign a petition. And we also did research that was later cited in articles and delivered to uh, politicians in the U.S. before a key hearing. So hmm. that had wow. a lot of impact to hopefully scrape up the take this project off the table um we also did creative stunts around that on just uh really highlighting the the really toxic impact that social media is having on especially teenagers and and young kids and it was picked up by the media which was pretty cool That's um awesome. but yeah yeah and See, I'd never heard of that. And it's like, this is why I'm now just going to check some of us every day, because it's like, how, how did I not hear about that? Like, not th that's something that we should all be aware of. And I have young nieces and nephews. I don't have children, but I have young nieces and nephews. And that that is a terrible idea. As you said, <laughs> that is the last thing our kids need in this world. So um, so that's really um, it's great to hear that there was some real kind of momentum out of that campaign. Yeah, Ildem, I'd love to hear you speak about a project that you were really passionate about as well. Castle, I think that's the million dollar question. I feel like every, like every day is like an act of passion in a way and just like also watching my colleagues doing what they do. Um, it's, yeah. So I really can't 
narrow it down, but I can tell you definitely one of the campaigns that were really exciting and really, yeah, great to watch and to see and to support to some extent. I, I in the French team uh, within some of us. We had a campaign where a hotel chain in Paris was being lobbied because they were not paying their um, cleaning staff well. And I think while it is like a, in a geographic sense, like a small scale campaign, it is very concentrated on this very specific hotel in Paris. I think it was still a very impactful one because it was tied to... Um, um, racism, it was tied to uh, unfair labor standards, right? There was a multitude of issues that this case or this campaign was targeting. And I think that was like one of the most impressive and like great moments for me to be a part of just like some of us and um, observing the French team really pushing for this campaign and winning it, really like um, helping these workers to get their demands, get a fair pay, get fair working conditions. I think that was incredible um, because these are the steps, I think, that set precedents for the work we do, but also around the world. Now, this was a big hotel chain um, and they were not treating the workers right in that specific location, but I'm sure it will cause some form of chain reaction, right? It's going to go. I am hoping for that there will be revisions on a wider scale for this hotel chain. Um, so these are the things, I mean, for me, it's really a lot, like almost everything we do, but this is one of the examples I can definitely say. It was a small scale one if you look from like a very uh, bird eye view, but I think it's still incredibly impactful and impressing to me in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Just to see two direct outcomes from direct action just happening in real time. You know, it's not nebulous for you all who are close to these topics. It's like we really can make change. And I think in this world where so many of us feel overwhelmed by some of the big problems and challenges and questions that we're facing kind of as a global community to be able to see at least small wins, which maybe they feel small to us from a zoomed out perspective, like you're saying, Ildan, but for these workers, it's not small. It's changed their lives now, their working lives and their professional lives and their their families you know, from now on, it sets precedent for other similar conversations. It creates awareness around that conversation. So other hotel chains or, you know, service organizations who employ cleaning staff feel that pressure because now people are talking about it more like this. It it's just, I think, probably encouraging to see, wow, we really are capable of so much if we just use the right tactics and build solidarity and build community movements, really, which I think, again, is kind of the linchpin that some of us sets up for people. Um which is, again, really encouraging. I mean, one thing I wanted to ask each of the three of you is because each of you day to day are so close to some some things which can be, I think, probably really encouraging and inspiring and empowering to see some of these positive outcomes. You also hear a lot about some pretty uh, challenging stuff out there and the ways that people are exploited, the way the planet is exploited. Like, how do you maintain balance for yourself when you're kind of having conversations like this every day with a lot of stuff that can be really heavy? Like, how do you keep yourselves engaged? Um, and, you know, how do you maintain that sense of purpose and, you know, hope for lack of a better word for yourself while when this is kind of your day in and day out? And maybe let's um, let's start with Angus. I'd love your thoughts. And then maybe we can go around to each of the three of you if that if that works. Yeah. I, I don't have a great answer for you. Like I, I, I feel like I may, may maintain okay. like yeah. it's hard to, it's related to one of the questions you asked. Like, like I, I, I took all social media off my phone. So, you know, I tried to hmm. not uh, really engage after, you know, I close my laptop and I feel like I need to be done. Um, I'm a newish parent. So I, I kind of just focus my energy on, on like uh, my uh, recently turned two year old and try to, Keep, keep, uh, it is quite heavy to to talk about like some of these issues. Uh, it's the wins, like and, and working with like great people, uh, great colleagues in, at some of us, and also just like some of the grassroots groups that I get to talk to on a weekly basis. That is like and and the collective work we do, and just the victories, and you know the letters I uh, that that like you know that I get from Maxima and 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 people that we work with uh, on behalf of that really inspires. So yeah, I mean the the answer is that uh, it, it's depressing. Um, I you know I try not to 
do too much of it outside of the work and try to you know, not, not follow the news too much over the weekend, but it's hard. I, it's also why I want to do the work. It's important work and we're being effective. So that is also inspiring. So it's a little bit of a double edged sword. Yeah. No, thanks. I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Thanks, Angus. How about you, Laura? Yeah, a lot of it is similar. Um, I think uh, whenever we do have a win, it's always a really powerful reminder that corporations sometimes seem untouchable and they're <laughs> way more fragile than they think they are when a lot of people <laughs> around the world come together. Um, I think also, yeah, wins that are in partnership with other organizations and that have a a direct impact or just are really fulfilling. And I think a lot of us got nurtured from things like that. Um, and I think, yeah, the organization, as some of us mentioned, it's very, we're very people, people centered and we do have an incredible team, um, that is dedicated to creating spaces internally for processing, for reflection, for, hmm. I think it's a very supportive, supportive team. We've also, had very hard conversations internally, depending on several, you know, political climate or several major events um, related to oppressive structures. And the real talk is sometimes really challenging internally, but there's space for that, you know, and it's important. And I think there's also an, an everyone has this intention of growing as individuals, but also collectively and just being more respectful human beings towards each other and becoming more aware there's always room to to grow and to keep learning in these things and i think everyone kind of has that mindset or that that's at least the the culture we create internally which makes a huge difference and and yeah lastly i'd say i mean inspiration from the millions of people that support our work you know like every every now and then we get really nice emails from people like sometimes it can seem like we're so wrapped up in in the issues and the campaigns and then we get you know one email saying you're awesome thanks for all your hard work and it really i don't know it's it's nice to see those things and we've also had a really inspiring initiatives actually related to your previous question on inspiring campaigns this, this wasn't necessarily like campaign it was kind of out of the box initiative we we did during the pandemic um that we created a, a support network, a COVID support network, where it was basically this website in multiple languages and people logged in and you could either offer help in any way, the financial or any kind of like, I'll go get your groceries or request help too. And it was just, I mean, to this day, it, it was just incredible how people who were across the planet that never spoke to each other just really showed up to, to help in such a challenging time for everyone. So I don't know. I think, I think for us being able to use the tools we have and the resources we have and, and seeing that impact sometimes on a very large scale, it's, it's inspiring. Yeah. So it's thing we hold on to moments like that, I think <laughs> to keep That's going. That's great. No, that's perfect. And I love what you said about how the organization creates space for you all to process too, because, you know, that's really important. And um, it's really great to hear that. Um, how about you, Ildem? What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I was, I mean, on the very surface level, I was like coffee cats, but most importantly, the collective. Right? What Laura said, I think is very, very important to lean into whatever you're feeling, because like for mm -hmm. whatever event happened, whatever thing we face, to really lean in and allow yourself to feel, but also ensure that you reflect on why you felt that way and how you will use that to grow, to be stronger, or um, to just put it into action. Um, so yeah, I can just echo back what Angus and Laura really said. It's for me, most importantly, the collective um, that supports one. So just leading into what you're feeling and it's okay to feel what you're feeling just make sure you you reflect on it and mm -hmm. make sure it's like uh placed uh in the right spot i think that is so well said and i think for me like the biggest takeaway from the experience of the pandemic was exactly that like every day felt like a bit of a roller coaster and just like exactly as you said you'll done lean into how you're feeling make space for yourself to kind of process it and deal with it in the way that's healthy both healthy for you and healthy for those around you and then you know learn from it and keep keep going you know it's like and in this world where it just seems like we're hit with 
you know, curveball after curveball these days. And when so many of us are concerned about environmental issues and some of the climate issues, and of course, human rights and, you know, political and governmental um, complexities, we could say diplomatically, um, it's, uh, it's so important for us to make space to just be there with the challenge of it emotionally. And then, find ways to connect with others to support ourselves to process and kind of pick ourselves back up and keep going and keep fighting for the things that we know matter which is peace which is human rights and equality which is the answer to these oppressive forces in the world um and um yeah no i i just again i think that's really well said um so just as we start to kind of get closer to wrapping up i'd love to hear you know maybe you ildim speak about You know, just because you all are so close to these issues, and we've talked about it a bit already, but I'd love to just hear you speak about, you know, what power does a global citizen have and what power do we have as communities, both locally and at the global level? Like, we've seen the power and the impact play out through the Some of Us initiatives. Like, as you've gotten close to these conversations over the last 10 months or so, as you said, you know, what has surprised you or what have you learned or, or what do you now have just part of your mindset from getting so close to these initiatives as far as, you know, what we really can do in the world as individuals and as we collaborate with each other? Right. I would say we have all the power. We really do. Um, it sounds so big and blue sky, but it is actually true. And especially like as you do this work, be it professionally as a campaigner or just like, you know, privately on your daily day, you really realize if we come together as a collective, because that's one thing that's really important. That's always stood out to me, especially like at my time with some of us is like, when you come together, you really move things. I mean, we had the examples, right. That we all shared just earlier, be it about Maxima um, or Sophia's case. When we all come together, we do have the power to really make a change and it really doesn't matter to what scale an individual does like it's it's that one signature that can make the difference that usually does make the difference right so signing a petition has the power going getting on the streets if that's your way to um be active that will have the power even if it's just sharing something on social media because that's your current resource set, your current tool that you have available. That's the power of speaking to someone. That's your power. Like, I don't think there's a good or bad way or the perfect way to exercise this people's power we have. It's just whatever you can do, that's the best way, I would say. And I think that's always comes through for us. It comes through for me, at least in my campaigning work. And it always comes through in the collective and the partnerships that we build. You will also see like a lot of our campaigns are always done in partnership with someone or some organization. It's usually more than just one partner that we work with or consult or um, that we try to get on board. And it's always that. And everyone just adds whatever they can to it. Right. It, it can also just be showing up like it's absolutely fine. But at the end of the day, it's just the people that have all the power <laughs> if you come together and act in a collective. Yeah, no, I I agree so much. Just it's not about how you make your impact or what scale, you know, at what scale you make your impact. It's just about getting involved, being part of the conversation and doing what you can, what makes sense for you, what resonates with you. I um I really resonate with that. Um is there anything that you would add to that, Laura or Angus, just as far as like um I don't know, anything you dovetail off of that thought with? Uh yeah, I guess I would just add I mean, educating ourselves is such a huge piece of it, right? It's uh, and there's it's the power in the collective too, but it's also the decisions we make every day. Um, I mean, our I've I've learned through some of us just the power of being a consumer. So it's it's the choices I make every day, what I choose to buy at the supermarket, where my products are coming from, how they're made, what businesses am I supporting. Um, all the structures of oppression involved in that too, who owns a business, who is this business catering to, what kind of media am I consuming? You know, there's, it's, it's everyday habits that we can really take more time to reflect on um, and, and what kind of stuff we're supporting. And it doesn't have to be a solo process, you know, like that's where what everything Eldon just said, like there are a ton of groups out there, you know, even just talking to your neighbors, <laughs> a lot of magic happens very, very, very locally, you know, and that never makes the news, but yeah, I think 
yeah, I, I love how Wildum said it. Just the uh, however, whatever you have at your disposal is is the right way to do it. You know. Yeah. I think that's such an important point about just empowering yourself with information so that you know what the meaning of your choices is, really. And we're, we have the luxury of so much access to information and we can really look into the companies that we're purchasing from and understand what values they have built into their supply chain or what values they very much don't have built into their supply chain. And what that means, you know, it can be a scary conversation to get involved with at first, but then it's so empowering because then you realize, well, if I, if I don't interact with this commu- this company, then that's a choice I'm making and that has power. And if enough of us make that choice, then they'll be forced to make changes, you know, and we see evidence of that too play out all the time. Um, well, thank you all so, so much. I think, again, an organization like some of us is really so crucial in this world and it's so well positioned to be the catalyst for these conversations, the catalyst for these kind of grassroots movements around the world. And that is such a big piece, I think, of what is going to be needed for us to really reshape this world and kind of have so many important conversations and move in a better direction collectively as more of us get involved with conversations like this and find ways to take action. So, you know, thank you for the work that you do to give people tools and options and ways to get educated and, and put their values into motion. I just really appreciate your time and I'm grateful that we had a chance to speak today. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. What I love most about some of us is the fact that they've created a platform that any of us can use to get involved in some way on issues all across the globe every day if we want to. It truly is an example of how technology and technological tools can drive momentum toward solutions and positive outcomes by educating us as citizens, empowering us with tools, and giving us opportunities to contribute to those solutions, to help to grow them. Some of us is an example of a tool that we didn't have 20 years ago. And don't forget, it's only been around for just over 10 years. The potential for this is huge if we keep growing platforms like this as more and more of us through technology and through many mediums of film and podcasts and everything become more aware of what's going on in the world. Some of us also drives home a truth for me that I think is so important to remember in this world where it seems like there's so much going wrong. There's so much that can make us feel overwhelmed, but the truth is No matter who we are, it's not about doing everything. It's about doing something. Signing a petition creates a collective voice around an issue that the organizers of the petition can then take to corporations and governments to say, people know about this, people care about this, and people expect you to do better. Any of us with internet access can sign a petition. That's something we can do. Learning more and building awareness is a meaningful act. It matters. Donating to a cause like Maxima Acuna's in Peru, who is standing up to Newmont Mining, or Sofia Gatica in Argentina, who is standing up to Monsanto, now buyer. Your funds, your support, your awareness of these two women fuels their movements, makes them stronger. There is a micro and a macro aspect here, I think. Some of us takes individual causes and grows micro movements around each of them. And then in the macro, awareness as it grows leads to change within global communities and amongst global organizations. And their name is perfect. Some of us, S-U-M, the sum total. Together, we are powerful which takes us perfectly to changemaker number one for today. Our first of three takeaways, which we explore after every conversation. Changemaker number one, the power of the people is real. Community action is a hugely powerful force, both on the ground and globally in global communities. This has become a big theme for us this year, and it's not frankly, totally intentional. It's just kind of the theme that's taken shape as we've gotten into this year. From Vandana Shiva, the globally respected Indian activist and scientist, to Bonnie Glambeck and the Fairy Creek blockade on Canada's west coast, to Ole von Uxkul of the Right Livelihood Foundation, our guests this year so far have repeatedly told us about how community organizing is the key to making true change. 
how communities are really where it happens, that empowering citizens with information and then building action around what is good for them as a community, as they define it, forces power structures to listen and to change in many cases. I love that this is what Ildem ended our conversation with. Ildem even admitted that it can sound cheesy or a bit cliche, but I mean, it's true. We have the power, and who would know better than a global campaigner for human rights initiatives around the world who is focused on these stories and these actions every single day? She and other members of the Some of Us team have seen governments change their messaging, seen corporations change their policies, they've seen individual activists get amplified and elevated so that their fights were successful all through the power of individuals coming together around ideas that they care about and lending their voice to them, their support, their physical presence in some cases, their own ideas about how to solve problems. The most important aspect about this idea, though, is that people have to first believe they have power, I think. People are only powerless when they believe they have no options available to them, no alternatives to the status quo. No options beyond their circumstances. So we really have to start by believing in our power to affect change, and then we take action to put that power into practice, to participate in global movements, to start difficult conversations, to use our money or our time or our creativity or whatever resources we have in service to larger ideas around how to make this world a better place. If we believe in that power and then see it play out, and then we believe it more as we see it play out, then anything is possible. One woman and her family in Peru have stopped a massively wealthy global mining corporation from doing something they very much want to do. That's the power of community voices, which takes us right into changemaker number two. Visibility matters. Another way of saying visibility in the way that I mean it here is transparency. Another huge takeaway for me when it comes to some of us is the powerful work they do to shine light on actions being taken by corporations and even governments behind closed doors. So often organizations are operating in the dark, which is what empowers them to do whatever they want as they hide what they're actually creating or doing to undermine human rights or the health of the planet through their supply chains, their operations, their decisions, their policies. Some of us's ability to increase awareness around these actions by global corporate interests makes a huge dent in their ability to operate in secrecy. Transparency leads to accountability, which in today's world leads to change, because corporations know that most people would find their actions and decisions to be deeply wrong, morally and in many ways, I imagine, so they hide them. An example I learned about, which I'd like to call out from the Some of Us campaigns as I was doing research for today's episode, is that the United Nations is now formally partnering with CropLife, a corporate alliance and lobbying group which represents the interests of the largest chemical and biotech corporations in the world. This blew my mind, so I'm going to dig in a little bit here for a minute, if you'll stick with me. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization, whose stated mission is to improve levels of nutrition and standards of living for all people of UN member nations and to free humanity from hunger, I pretty much pulled that straight from their website. They signed a letter of intent to collaborate and share data with CropLife, which, as I said, is a lobbying organization and alliance, which represents global agrochemical giants like BASF and Bayer in Germany, Monsanto, which is now part of Bayer, of course, because it was purchased by them, Syngenta, Japan's Sumitomo Chemical, and two companies in the United States, Corteva, which was formerly a division of Dow Chemical, and FMC. In other words, the largest in the game. And despite data, which clearly shows that pesticide use, which almost all these organizations focus on in their products, causes severe and wide-ranging health issues, the fact that about 44% of farmers and agricultural workers around the world are poisoned every year by pesticides, which means that about 385 million individual cases of pesticide poisoning is happening every year, This is according to a peer-reviewed study, by the way, that was published in December 2020. You can see it on the BMC Public Health 
journal, if you're interested. We'll post a link to that on our episode page for today. This is almost 15 and a half times more events of pesticide poisoning happening in the world in 2020 than was reported in 1990, which is the last year that a comprehensive study was done at all. In other words, as pesticide use and agrochemical giants have grown, so has poisoning and death. It seems to me, and I think this is why some of us is talking about this, that there is a clear conflict between corporations which are essentially profiting off of illness and exploitation working with a United Nations organization which is charged with improving quality of life for all people. Why is the UN working together with this lobbying group and corporate alliance? What's going on behind that? These are the questions some of us is asking, and the stories they're sharing with their community members. I never would have heard of this if not for some of us. This is not the kind of story you're likely going to see on almost any news source, so it's really up to people-driven movements to find and share them so that we can ask important questions and demand answers to those questions and course correct where needed. And finally, change maker number three. We are more powerful when we stand together. This might sound obvious, and it might sound like a repeat of changemaker number one, but let me explain. There's another aspect of visibility here, beyond visibility into corporate behavior, in other words, transparency. And I think the story of Maxima Acuna in Peru is a perfect example of what I'm talking about here. Maxima made a stand in her town, one mother of one family, telling a massively powerful global corporation that they cannot proceed with their goal of making huge profits because of her, because of her choice. Let me tell you a little bit more about Maxima. In the early days of her struggle, despite possession of a legal deed to her land, armed forces came to her home and demanded that she and her family leave. When she wouldn't, they destroyed her house and beat her daughter unconscious. They sued her for $2,000 and a three-year prison sentence, claiming that she was squatting on her own land. They began destroying her potato crops, which she and her family grow to survive. They are subsistence farmers. They built a fence around her land to restrict her movements and intimidate her, yet Maxima and her family stood strong, and the Denver-based Newmont Mining Company has still not moved forward with the hugely profitable gold mine that would destroy the ecosystems around Maxima's home. Which, by the way, includes draining an entire lake, which supports a whole ecosystem around it. That would be required to build this mine. So Maxima knows this isn't just about her. As Maxima's letter to Angus described, which I was so glad he read, she could not have maintained her fight without support from local legal experts who helped her, without awareness around the world of her struggle, and without financial support to protect her and her family, as their livelihood and safety continued to be threatened to this day. The fight isn't over. There's no doubt that Newmont is just waiting for an opportunity to move in, for the attention on this situation to go away but with support from individuals like us who can use our voices and our attention and our money even to support Maxima, she can successfully continue her stand and inspire other indigenous landowners around the world to do the same. Exploitation thrives in silence. Intimidation thrives when victims feel alone and afraid, powerless, small, Corporate bullying is strongest when nobody is paying attention. The campaigns of some of us shine that light where light is needed so that none of us take on these massive interests alone, so that we all work to protect what matters together. One person in one place can often be silenced, bullied, and abused, but millions of people all over the globe cannot. Here's what you can do to get involved today. If you don't already, begin to engage with online action platforms like some of us. There are many out there, so you can find one that aligns well with your values, your point of view, your approach to the world and to these topics, the ones that you really care about. Some of us may resonate with you, and you may gain a lot from it. We also got a recommendation from Bonnie Glambeck, our recent 
Guest, who represents Clackwood Action, the grassroots conservation group on Canada's Vancouver Island, which is working with local and indigenous groups to protect their local ecosystems, Bonnie told us about Beautiful Trouble which I've visited and have gotten a ton of information from. It's a great resource for movement building and legal information and planning around direct action. Change.org is a well-known option. Jump on to FridaysForFuture.org if you're especially passionate about climate and sustainability. Take whatever action you can today to learn more and lend your voice to campaigns and movements around the world which are driving change and advocating for equality on the ground. Our challenge for you today grows out of you finding whatever platform you resonate most with. Find a campaign on that platform that speaks to you and take action on it. Sign a petition. Join a mailing list or two. Donate to a cause that's live right now if you can. Amplify the messages out there, the voices who are protecting human rights and the rights of living things and ecosystems everywhere by sharing your chosen campaign with others on social media or within your work or personal community. And then share that campaign with at least one person in your life directly, someone you know. Let it be a larger community and then your immediate circle. A family member, a friend, a coworker, a checkout person at the grocery store if it happens naturally and you happen to broach these topics. It doesn't matter who, just share it with at least one person. If you do any number of these things, I mean that right there could be 10 actions you've taken to support a campaign that you care about. I've done it. It feels good. It feels like you are doing something that matters. There's meaning behind your actions, your conversations. And it doesn't matter how people respond to it. You know, not everyone will agree with you or have the same perspective or even maybe care. And that's okay. Just give yourself the opportunity to spread the word and notice how it makes you feel. Maybe you'll be nervous at first. Then maybe it'll be exciting. Maybe you'll feel empowered. And then you may consider doing it more often. As we've said many times on our show, these conversations just build momentum around things that we all want to see in the world, so even small actions add up. If you'd like to learn more about Some of Us, visit them at someofus.org. S-U-M-O-F-U-S dot org. The best way to support them is probably just to get involved. Check out all of the active campaigns on their website. If you sign a petition, you'll be added to their mailing list, which will keep you up to speed on other global campaigns happening around the world. I did this myself, and I'm so glad to be on their list. The emails that I get from them teach me so much every time. Even if I don't have time to read into the details of every single one, I'm still glad to get them and to save them for later. It's a great resource. There's so much opportunity to learn more about and to contribute to constructive movements focused on empowering people to make change and counteract corporate exploitation. If you're able to donate, you can support their mission financially as well. Most of their funding comes from individual donors. If you're curious, some of us post all of their financials on their website and they're primarily funded by individual donors and secondarily funded by some foundations. You can learn more if you want to dig into that aspect, which is an important thing to think about and to look into at someofus.org. You can also find opportunities to join direct action opportunities, learn about the partners some of us is working with, and explore the COVID support network that they've created, which Laura told us about, to give people around the world the chance to connect with and directly seek help or give help to those who need it. Listen, it's a big world out there with a lot of complex challenges. Change won't happen overnight. These are big topics with big players and big implications. Change won't happen overnight. Change won't happen easily. But without us, change won't happen at all. And learning about organizations like some of us remind us that we are never alone with wanting to see a better world take shape. It's not about just me or just you and what we're doing individually. We're not doing anything alone. We're not the only ones who care, who are distressed, who are frustrated, who are hopeful. The more we can engage with and amplify our voices within communities, the faster we'll understand how powerful we are, which will truly begin to transform this world. Start today. Do what you can. Join conversations. Start conversations. Engage with us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Subscribe to our show and give us a rating and review to help circulate these messages to more listeners. 
Share this episode with people around you. Listen to our other episodes with dozens of inspiring individuals and amazing organizations who are truly changing the world. Our mission is to make it easier for you to make an impact. Help us accomplish our mission. Help us amplify these important voices. Thanks for being here with us. Join us in two weeks for our conversation with Tony Renato of Australia, also known as the Forest Maker. Tony developed a method which has led to hundreds of millions of trees being regrown across 25 countries in Africa, and several now in Asia as well, transforming the lives of farmers and local communities and economies all around the world. Simply by working with nature, and recognizing a resource that we already had under our feet all along. It's a fascinating and inspiring conversation. Until then, be well, stay in peace, and remember, true change starts with us. So let's start.